faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here from Into 3 Fitness, and welcome to the Better Humanology Podcast. This week we have Julie Bauer from Paleo OMG. You've probably heard of the website. I had a lot of amazing information, paleo recipes, and some phenomenal cookbooks. And so today we talk a little bit about paleo. We talk about training. We talk about what to do if your family is not super supportive of your nutritional habits and lifestyle, as well as a lot of other things. So listen to this one from beginning to end. Without any further ado, here is Julie Bauer. All right, Julie, welcome to the Better Humanology podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to talk to you today, but I want to get before we get into anything or background introductions, anything like that, uh, would you mind sharing a fitness challenge with us today? Well, since it's the new year and everybody's super motivated and in the gym and working super hard and really pushing themselves, I thought I would kind of turn it a different route and remind people to make sure to get your rest days in and let your body recover. Cause I feel like everybody wants to go so hard and wants to lose weight and build more muscle and all this crazy stuff. But if you don't let your body heal, then it's not going to give you the full benefit. So rest, take a rest day, take a couple rest days a week, let your body heal. That is my fitness challenge right now. Yeah. And avoid, you know, not only from the, the body standpoint, the mind, right? Give yourself a, a break. If, especially if people are trying to hit something new in the, in the year that they're not accustomed to. Yeah. Burnout is awful. Totally. All right. uh, How about a mental toughness challenge? So my mental toughness challenge is going to be sticking with your either New Year's resolution or goal because we always see so many people set their goals and resolutions. And then by maybe March, April, we really start to lose sight of those goals. And I think it is so mentally challenging to make sure you stick with that goal every single day. And so for me to make sure I stick with my workout goals and what I've put my um, mind to, I always write those goals down every day. So I write down when I'm going to work out and what my workout's going to consist of. And that holds me accountable. So the mental goal is to hold yourself accountable through these this entire year for multiple years holding yourself accountable to those goals because you made those goals for a reason. They weren't just made out of thin air. I love that. Yeah, I, sticking power. It's like the hardest thing to do, you know, discipline, but the most important. And are you a big uh, goal setter? I am. I mean, I'm not, I think, yeah, I think I am. I always kind of set goals and I always try to accomplish them. And if they're, even if that route changes, I set new goals. So yeah, I think I am a pretty big goal setter. Awesome. And how about a book recommendation? Anything you're currently reading or just a a book may have had a big impact on your life? Well, one of my friends just came out with um, her newest cookbook, Diane Sanfilippo. I love her. And um, I'm actually doing a book tour uh, signing with her in a week from now. So her newest book is the 21, 21 day sugar detox daily guide. And I've done her 21 day sugar detox. And I think it is absolutely amazing, especially if you have addiction to sugar in any way, which most of us do at some point. Um, her book is just great and it has journaling aspect to it as well. So you can really keep yourself accountable. So that's my recommendation right now. That's awesome. And we'll link to that in the show notes. And uh, how was the I've heard some pretty crazy stories. I'm I'm I guess I would consider myself on a low sugar diet, but I've never fully like done a sugar detox. How was your 21 day experience? Well, when I did it, it was probably five or six years ago. And I was addicted as hell to sugar. I was craving it so bad. I was eating it all the time. And so by day five on the 21 day sugar detox, your body is like in shock. You have no energy. And so you kind of have to add in a little bit more carbohydrates, um, in like sweet potatoes or however, whatever you're eating is carbohydrates. And that really helped out. But it's crazy once you break that cycle, if you've ever been addicted to sugar and you've been able to break that, it's crazy. Like, 
how your body just takes over. And once you have that freedom, oh my gosh, it's the best because sugar is so bad for you. It's a bummer, but it's so bad for you. (laughs) Yeah. And I've I've heard about coaches giving this challenge to athletes before and they like get the shakes and stuff, you know, all of the really bad stuff that comes with like being severely addicted to something. It's insane. Totally. It's crazy. All right. Thank you uh, for the challenges and the book recommendation. So for anyone uh, listening out there who might not know who you are, what you do, I'd love uh, for you to fill us in with a little bit of background information, uh, what you're doing now and, and what you're passionate about. Yeah. Well, my name is Julie. I started the blog paleomg.com um, about like seven years ago, probably. And um, I was kind of fresh out of college. I had just started doing CrossFit on my own. And then I decided I wanted to compete in CrossFit, but I knew I needed to get my diet in check because I ate terribly. Like I had no idea how to cook. Um, my food choices were awful and I was in and out of the hospital constantly because I was in so much physical pain. Um, my digestive tract was all out of wax and never once did a doctor tell me to look at my diet. Like they just fed me whatever antibiotics and other crap and sent me on my way. So, um, I finally decided I wanted to really get my diet in check, um, to be able to compete at a really competitive level in CrossFit. So I started cooking, started making recipes up on my own, sharing those recipes with friends. And, um, my friends asked me to start a blog So I started paleomg.com and started sharing recipes weekly and, um, Facebook was very different back then. And so when someone would share my recipe, all their friends would see it. And so more people started finding my blog and, uh, paleo blogs weren't really big yet. And so people came over and started reading and commenting and it kept growing. And then, um, a year or two in, I was able to make it my full-time job. And then it grew into a real lifestyle blog. So I talk about fitness every week. I do fashion posts. I do home decor, beauty. I really talk about anything that's interesting in my life, like travel that I've been doing lately. And I share all that along with my paleo recipes on my blog. That's awesome. And yeah, I've, I've followed along, uh, on the blog and uh, your Instagram, you know, I've seen a lot of your the information content you've been putting out over the years, um, and yeah, you're you're always around, you know, being shared and and everybody loves your stuff. So I think you've done a great great job over the last uh, seven years doing this. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I. Uh, it's crazy starting this blog. It just was just to share recipes, and then it became more to like empower other women and men, of course, but to empower other women to take responsibility for themselves and their bodies and for their emotions and really take control of their lives and how they're taking care of their bodies. And it's been so fun to share my experience and what I've gone through myself and watch other people go through those situations and talk about it on my blog. It's been, it's been really cool. Yeah. That's, that's something I noticed from your, I just think, kind of the what would be the underlying theme of your some, a lot of your content is like you genuinely want to help people and I think that that comes across uh where do you think that desire came from I mean is, is it because you had some results and you wanted other people to see the same thing like what what motivates you uh because some people could find you know something that works for them and not care to share it at all so what, what motivated you to do that Well, I think in the food and fitness industry, we're just bombarded with a lot of, can I, can I cuss on this podcast? Yes, you can. Okay. I was just going to say bullshit, but I didn't want to offend anybody for not allowed to say that, but I think we're just bombarded with a lot of bullshit and, um, it's really hard to, to file through all of that and to know where to look. And I remember being in high school and putting myself on diet pills and taking these energy drinks so I could work out for two to three hours and just like complete bullshit. And I wish I would have had someone to look up to, to say, Oh, it can be as just as simple as working out every week and eating real food. And you can see dramatic changes, not only in your physical appearance, but your mental ability. And I wish I would have had somebody to tell me that it's really that simple instead of showing me all these different protein powders and supplements and these workouts that really didn't make a difference when I tried them. So 
that's why I want to share it because I wish I would have had that when I was younger and I was just destroying my body with all this crap. So that's, I mean, that's the main reason I share it. I had such amazing results and from eating paleo and from working out and doing CrossFit and taking care of myself. And I want others to just take care of themselves instead of just buying all this crap online and hoping for this magic pill because that's just not how it works. Yeah, if you stick to the real popularized information, you know, that can, or should, you know, the, the magazines that have the, the greatest reach and stuff, you know, they're typically not the ones that are giving the best information, but they're, they're selling a lot of magazines. Uh, what What would you say if any problems did you have with following that bad advice? Uh, you said you were taking a bunch of energy drinks and, uh, you know, not doing a lot of things that maybe maybe seemed healthy, but you not, you now know aren't. Um, did anything negative result in all that? I mean, I, I had a ton of stomach issues growing up because of the gluten I was eating, but I'm sure the other diet pills and the uh, supplements and energy drinks, everything that I was consuming did not help by any means. So it took, um, it took probably three or so years to completely heal my gut. And I had leaky gut and had all kinds of issues and was allergic to all kinds of things because of that. And so it took years to heal. Um, but more than anything, doing all those things was just so mentally draining. And I think I missed out on a lot of things in my life because I was so insanely obsessed with the physical and looking like a certain person instead of just being the best version of myself and enjoying the journey and enjoying the results time after time. Before, I would just look in the mirror and hate everything about myself. And I was physically frozen. I didn't do anything. I didn't go out. I didn't spend time with friends because I was so unhappy. And so I I think I just missed out more than anything because of those obsessing over like fitness magazines and wanting to look like these fitness models. It was just such a dark time. And do you ever feel any of that? Like, do you still struggle with any of that today? You know, I mean, you're still very into health and fitness. Obviously, is it ever creep back that obsession that makes you want to, I don't know, makes you feel differently, I guess? Oh, absolutely. I think that's a daily battle. Um, I find myself having to unfollow people sometimes because, um, like fitness girls, I love to follow because I love seeing some of the movements they do and trying to enter those in my own, uh, workout routine. But I'll find myself thinking, well, why don't I look like that girl? I've been working this hard for this many years. I should look like that. And I'll have to, I'll find myself having to unfollow them and getting it completely out of my mind and moving forward. And, but it's definitely a battle on a regular basis and not, it's just, it's totally a battle and it's something you have to work on and think about and say, okay, I'm not going to feel this way. I'm going to work my ass off how I always do at my job and the gym with eating healthy meals. And I can't wait to see what the future brings, but it's definitely a battle and I don't think it'll ever fully go away, but you can really change the way you think if you're ready to do that. And how did you transition from, let's see, if I, let me, if I were to draw a timeline here, uh, you know, maybe some, you said gluten in your diet early on, uh, to having digestive, uh, problems it took you a couple years to, to figure that out. But where did, where did fitness like come into this? Uh, I mean, have you been to fitness your whole life? Um, cause I think you were probably still not having the best diet when you're, you're still having digestive issues. I mean, when you were doing fitness, so when did working out start? Well, working out, I, I was a swimmer for part of my life. And then when I stopped swimming in high school, I, um, would go to the gym and I would be on the, like the stairmaster for like two hours. And, would start doing some lifting weights and then I would just go through periods of working out. So I was always into fitness and I always, I really wanted to find confidence in the gym, but I just had a hard time with it. Um, and it was, I found CrossFit in probably my junior year of college and then started doing CrossFit and really building that fitness routine. And that's when I started CrossFit, it was probably about a year into doing CrossFit on my own that I said, okay, it's time to start changing my diet. And then it started from doing the zone diet. So I was mostly 
you're not counting calories, but you're doing kind of moderation with your food and then went into paleo diet within like the second year of doing CrossFit, if that all makes sense. It does make sense. And what did you do specifically to heal your leaky gut? I mean, I cut out all gluten. I wasn't drinking any alcohol. Um, I, and I stuck to a pretty clean paleo diet. So I didn't do any gluten-free grains back then, no legumes, no dairy. Um, and that was it. I was eating a very, very simple diet of like chicken, broccoli, avocado for almost every meal because I was, uh, training and, I was working at a couple different jobs, so I had to pack all my food with me for the entire day. So I would just eat with these simple meals, and my gut was really able to heal itself over time that if I have a little bit of gluten in my diet nowadays, I can get past it. It doesn't ruin me, but before, I would be in bed for hours. Wow, that's that's crazy. And you said it took a full two to three years to feel like you were finally like recovered from that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, it took a while. Yeah, and I could see it taking a long time to to fix a problem like that. Uh, now, now going back to you went full time um, on Paleo MG, and uh, you said a, a year to two years after opening it. Yeah, I uh, can't remember the exact timeline, but it was within the first and second year. That's awesome. And so day one, you start the blog. Um, did you think that it would be a full time job? Uh, fast forward a year, two years. 100% no. I had no idea you could make money off blogs. And they've really come a long way in the past seven years that I've been writing blogs. Um, and yeah, I had I had zero clue that this would be a job in general. I just started, I put Google ads on my website at one point. Um, and that started making a little bit of money. And then I had a couple companies reach out to me. But I had no clue this would be my job in any capacity. I thought I would be um, a personal trainer or own a gym. That was kind of my end goal. But yeah, it changed directions. Well, that's awesome. And it's it's a, it's a lot of fun. So I run online business too, um, full time. But I'd like to hear from you. What's been your biggest, let's go with struggle in running an online business? Ooh, not being a complete bitch when people are mean <laughs> to me on the internet. Like that's something I'm very, I'm trying to work on. It's hard not trying to stick up for yourself. And, um, that's like one of the hardest things It's just human interaction and everybody has an opinion and you work so hard to come up with content and come out with great, a great product. And then someone puts you down for it and it's really hard. And you, I get those reviews on my cookbooks and apparel or whatever it is. And, it's hard to hear that. So I'm trying to take feedback, whether it's negative or positive in um, a better way. But I think that's the hardest struggle is just hearing other people's opinions of things that you've worked really, really hard on and worked your ass off for and someone doesn't like it. I think that's the toughest part because you want everybody to like everything you do, but that's just not life. <laughs> yeah, especially to the the reach you have, you know, it's impossible to like you probably can't even post like an Instagram post without somebody saying negative about something in the picture uh, somewhere, right? You know, it's uh, yeah. sometimes people are just that way. It's really unfortunate. Yeah, uh, yeah it sucks. So what's your favorite thing about running an on online business? I mean, working for yourself. Working for my own self is the best. I get to make my own schedule every single day. I get to work from home. I get to come up with the content I'm interested in. And if I'm not interested in it, I can change direction and do whatever I want. But I get to call the shots and work with amazing company and amazing brands. And so just working for yourself is such freedom. It's amazing. And uh, tell me about writing your first cookbook. Yeah, that was a big learning experience for sure. I wrote my first one probably in like 2012, I believe, and um, went with this publisher who reached out to me and I did not like my experience. So I went with a different publisher for my second two cookbooks. Um, but yeah, it was a total different experience coming up with all the content for it in a certain time frame, and you have your contract and um, promoting it and learning how to promote without pushing stuff down people's throats. It's it's definitely a learning experience and it's hard work. Writing a book is 
tough and it's time consuming and it takes you away from all the other work that you need to do on top of that. So it was definitely all three books were big learning experiences. And has the process gotten a little bit easier each time? Absolutely. The first one was, um, it's funny because I think of the first one as like me in high school and then the second one was college and then the third one was grad school. So <laughs> each one, you have more of a vision of what you really want to come out with and um, you can trust the process more because in the beginning, you're just so in the dark and you have no idea what's going to happen. And the second time around, I knew a little better. And the third one, I really knew what I wanted to come out with. Um, and I have no plans to write another cookbook at this point. So that third one was exactly what I wanted in a cookbook. It was nice to be able to, um, get better and come up with even better recipes as I went on. And are you just taking a break or you just don't have one planned or what? Yeah, I just don't have one planned. I, love working on my blog. That is my true passion because I can do whatever I want. And every week I share workouts, then I share food, then I share beauty or travel and fashion. And so it can really range. And cookbook, you know, it's say 150 recipes and you have to come up with 150 recipes in a certain time frame, and they all have to be photographed and written up and edited. And it's just not as fun. And I want this job to be fun. And so I'm just sticking with the blog and doing fun things every single day. That's awesome. Yeah, I've, I saw some of your blog posts about uh, some of the workouts you, you do. Uh, wh- how do you how do you come up with them or do you get them from somewhere? So all the CrossFit workouts I do are at the CrossFit gym that I work out with. Okay. And then any accessory stuff, I just all kind of look up different workout people on Instagram or things I've done in the past. And I've just been working. I'm just trying to build a bigger butt in 2018. So mm-hmm. I've just been doing butt accessory workouts on the side. And I kind of just make those up and do try different things that I haven't done in a while and see how it feels. And so let's see, cross, you, have you been doing CrossFit as long as Paleo MG or before? Yeah, CrossFit, I started in probably 2009. Okay. So, I think I yeah. started my blog in 2011. So a little bit longer than um, Paleo MG. That's awesome. And you, uh, you never turned back. No, I mean, I've done other things on top of CrossFit. So I've done Orange Theory. Um, I've done some Pilates, like reformer Pilates and different spinning classes and running and my accessory stuff on the side, but CrossFit is my go-to love of my life. I mean, it completely changed my life for the better. And I love the gym that I work out with at. I've been there for probably seven years. So, and I train, I was a trainer there as a coach there for six of those years. So I love it. I can't imagine doing anything else. And uh, yeah, I saw that you, uh, you coach as well. Do you still coach? No, I just stopped coaching probably two months ago. Okay. My certification ran up and I just wasn't interested in recertifying and it freed up more time for me to even do more stuff at home on my blog. So I just work out there now. That's funny. We we must have gotten our level ones pretty close to the same time. My uh, Mine expires in I think like two months or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard because then you're like, okay, am I going to really use this certification and get the full, you know, however much it costs? Right. benefit from it. So, and I just wasn't going to do that. So it was time to move on. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. I'm going to transition to the book question. Um, so this is, this is an unplanned, uh, question. We ask it sometimes and sometimes we don't, but I think you'd be a really good fit because you have written some books. Um, so if there was a nationwide curriculum implemented and the president calls you up and he says that you're going to be responsible for one chapter inside of this book, and so every single child in America will have to read your chapter and be tested on it before they can pass and graduate uh, from high school. What would you want your chapter to be about? Well, I would, oh, shoot. I would, yeah, I would do paleo for sure. I would talk about the paleo diet, why it is so incredibly important and why um, the USDA is not teaching what we need to be taught. And um just really explain to children the importance of high quality proteins and organic vegetables and staying away from processed food and sugar and 
soda, like getting these things out of our diet and why and how they affect the body long term. I think I wish I would have understood and known that information when I was a kid. And who knows if it would have made a difference because you're a kid and you're like, I don't care. I'm going to eat fucking little Debbie snack cakes. But I wish I would have had that information earlier. And so I could have implemented into my own life and just understood it better. That's, that's my main thing. I would want people to understand the paleo diet, not that they have to do that, but creating a a ground level understanding of why these foods are better for you than processed foods in general. Yeah, that's, that's tough too. You know, I think that would be, it's such great information, but it's hard, you know, with, uh, just kids in general. I know we have a, I have a cousin in my family who has some inflammation problems that, are, are, you know, very much and more, more than likely linked to diet. And we've recommended the paleo diet and, and going strict on that. And she's just absolutely not interested. Like, even though she has these health problems, she just does not care about totally. your diet. You know, I'm like, it baffles, you know, but you can't from it's your most of America, more, your more mature brain can't, uh, you know, put itself on a on a young, young kid. But the, the information is, is so valuable. Yeah. And I mean, adults still have so many issues with that. You tell an adult why these things are better and they understand it, but they don't want to implement it into their own life. And, or you see parents who will eat a certain way, but they won't do that for their children. It's just doesn't make sense. But I, I wish more people understood how important diet is for not only your brain, but your physical body and long-term and fertility and everything. It's crazy. We, people need to know more about food. Yeah, and then even in the the fitness industry, because it, se- it sounds like you've been a part of both, and I think I feel like I was at one point too, where you're you're doing what you think that you should be doing, but it's in no way really healthy or, or good for you, you know, from from things that you know now about the paleo diet. Uh, yeah, th- and did you experience a lot of that? I think mostly just well, I think I still see that now where people are doing if it fits your macros and they're just putting total shit into their body because it fits their extra macros in that day, stuff like that. I see those where, um, people are eating things that they know they shouldn't, but because it fits a certain concept that they can do it. And that kind of stuff, I'm just not a fan of. I rather you be not fitting inside your macros and eating whole foods instead of this like fat-free chocolate with fat-free ice cream and like fat-free caramel sauce, like fucking weird shit like that. (laughs) I hate that in the fitness industry. And I still think we see that on a regular basis. Yeah, that's, it's funny how these things can like start in one. I mean, it's even like CrossFit, like CrossFit at its core, because I mean, you've been to level one, you've coached for a long time at its core is an amazing thing. Um, you know, and they, they want you to have really good form and, uh, the exercise methodology is good. And then it's, it's people who take it to that, that next level or, or try and take concept of it and push it too far where, you know, people might be getting injured more frequently And the same in diet is like, okay, we're going to start using macros with clean eating to try and, you know, reshape your body. And then people are like, yeah, but you gave me this many macros. So why not, (laughs) you know, something, some terrible ice cream or whatever. It's just always unfortunate when, uh, we as humans take, take it like that, you know? Yeah. And we do with most everything, you know, like as human beings, we love pushing things to the limits and seeing how far we can go with them, but that's not always the best idea. No. All right. So how I I have, uh, two questions on more personal note. How do you like Denver? Denver's the best. I love it here. I hate the snow. So this winter has been amazing since it hasn't been snowy at all. But I grew up in Colorado. I was born and raised here and I've lived in Denver for ever since I got out of college. And it's amazing. I mean, there's so many places to eat. There's so many things to do. You can be outside almost every single day. And the people are awesome here. I just love Denver. It'll be hard if we ever have to leave and move somewhere else. Yeah. Are you guys thinking about leaving? No, no. But we always talk about if any career changes um, or just an opportunity comes up, if we would move. And there are very few places I would move to. Austin is the only place I would really want to move to. But I don't want to (laughs) move. I love Denver so much. Yeah. So you're a big fan of Austin. I love Austin. 
I love it. I go there once a year at least. Okay. Yeah. That's a, so I lived in Dallas for a long time. Uh, yeah. Majority of my life and was in Austin quite a bit. I think the only thing you probably wouldn't like about Austin is how ridiculously hot it gets, but I don't know. Maybe I know. <laughs> I know. Well, my thing is we'd have to live on a lake if we're going to live exactly. in Austin. So then you can just walk out straight to the water and that makes up for the 110 with 110 humidity. <laughs> All right. Now, another question I had out of curiosity. So you've written three cookbooks and you come up with the recipes? Yes. Okay. What? Because I, I don't, I'm not 100% familiar with your background, but I don't think, you know, you initially started down that path. So how, where do you get all these recipes from? Like, how, how do you, do, is it a lot of experimentation and just because you are cooking your own stuff all, all the time? Like, how, how does this, uh, how do they come about? So it started when, um, when I first started, I had no idea how to cook. I cooked a couple recipes online. So I remember going to Diane Sanfilippo, the author of the book that I mentioned at the beginning of the show. Um, I m- went to her website, balancebites.com, and I remember cooking a recipe from that and just understanding how things kind of went together. I remember making a banana bread um, and it had almond flour in it and bananas and seeing how things rise and how they um, bind together with certain products. And so I started understanding that and looking at recipes online. And I would say, well, what, what does baking soda do? What does baking powder do? What does um, a certain spice tastes like in a recipe. And you just start to learn what is the kind of basis of all these recipes. Oh, well, I want some garlic. I want onions. I want peppers. And then I can start adding proteins and I can add, start, start adding spices in different ways. Um, but it was a lot of cooking from different paleo websites in the beginning. And I, what I hated about it is I had to follow directions and I am very ADD. I don't like following directions in general and paying attention to something, I much rather throw shit in a pan, figure it out (laughs) on my own. And so that's what I started to do because I would start fucking up these recipes that weren't, weren't my own. I rather mess up my own. So I started playing around and I would start taking things that I would want to eat. So I want to eat a chocolate chip muffin that I had before I went paleo. How am I going to do this? a lot of experimentation, um, and just understanding how flowers work together and what doesn't work. And okay, I want a taco casserole because that sounds amazing. I, I just posted that, um, just today on my Instagram. So I make up ways to, uh, what do I want in a taco? I'm going to put that all in a casserole. And so it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of fails. And I still, I just had a failure yesterday with a recipe and you just kind of build off those fails and why something didn't work. And it's just nailing it down. And then once you have a base of many recipes, it's pretty easy to start creating new ones with those base recipes, like muffin recipes. I have a base that I really like and I can make a million different kinds of muffins and a million different kinds of banana breads and casseroles and burgers. And then it's pretty easy to start coming up with recipes. But I take a lot of inspiration from restaurants that I eat at or pictures I see on Pinterest or um, things that I had in my, you know, previous paleo life that I loved eating and how do I make that paleo and that's kind of how I come up with it and do you ever do you have a process for like accumulating and acting on those ideas if you're at a restaurant do you just snap a photo and then tag a note for later is there any particular process you follow there yes I'll, I'll do that a lot especially with cocktails which I don't make that often on my website I always want to but I'll like take a picture of what's in that cocktail um, or maybe what's in that appetizer and then I I have a notes section on my phone that I write down all my posts that are coming up um, and then I have a section for recipe development and what I want to come up with and then I kind of build ideas off of that so if I say I want to do this cocktail but then it's not sounding good but I can kind of take that base that I want a jalapeno in my cocktail, um, and then build from there. But I have a full section in my notes section of recipes coming up and, um, things I want to try and make. And that's kind of how I do it. And do you have like a, say a war or horror story on like a recipe you were trying to get right? And it just had, you had to keep trying over and over and over again. Um, yeah, I think I have many, many baking ones. I had this damn freaking, chocolate pecan pie 
like squares bars I was trying to make, um, over Thanksgiving this year. And I just, and I kept sharing on Instagram stories and I was making it day after day after day and it just kept failing. So I finally gave up on it because Thanksgiving had passed and it was time to move on to other recipes. And I, it sucks buying like pounds of pecans over and over (laughs) when I don't, I don't even eat nuts. And so it's like, I'm just wasting these. They're just going in the trash, even though they taste good. So that's, it's been mostly baking. Just the other day I failed at cookies. And so I just try it again later on when I get my patience back. Yeah. That's what uh, my, my mother-in-law is like an expert baker. And it's like, I don't get it. Yeah. She's incredibly uh, intelligent. And so it's almost like a, like chemistry, like lab every time she, yes. cause she'll explain it to me. Cause I'll, I'm anyone, anytime someone is like, good at something like really good at, I, I will listen to you whatever you have to say even if I'm I, I will never learn or do that you know it's just fascinating to see people who are good at things and it's like man I'm getting like more of a science lesson right now than I am you know just talking about uh you know how what to set the oven at and how many degrees and everything with all the I know the thought that goes into those recipes Ugh, it's so exhausting baking is awful I don't know how people <laughs> enjoy it it's like so time consuming and I rather just like throw meat in a pan with some salsa and call it good. I rather just not even eat the dessert. I don't care. Or just eat the dough. Like I rather just eat the dough and not even see how the baking end product comes out. Like, no thanks. So baking is not my strong suit. And what's your favorite uh like go to dinner recipe like for you and your husband? You're married, correct? Yes. Yeah, you and your husband. Um, I mean we're we're very simple in our house. He is kind of on a leaky gut protocol right now. So he's not able to have a lot of foods, but one of our go-to, as soon as we got home from Cabo, uh, last week, we always get some sort of seafood and green vegetables. So my main thing I've been doing right now is some sort of protein, whether, whether it's a burger or scallops or salmon or steak, whatever it is. And then, um, just simple pan cooked. And then I'll do kale with some red peppers and garlic and then other, what other kind of vegetable I want, whether that's an arugula salad or, um, roasted carrots or roasted beets, whatever I feel like. I just try to get a big color rainbow on my plate. But one of my go-to recipes that I love, and it becomes, um, I think people's stepping stone onto paleo G is my, pizza spaghetti casserole. So it's one of my most popular recipes. And I think it's a great stepping stone if you're dabbling in paleo and still kind of scared of it. It's a recipe that tastes like there's cheese and it's just covered in good stuff. It's just delicious. So that's kind of my go-to, especially if I'm having friends over, it's an easy casserole to make. Okay. Yeah. We'll definitely uh, find that one and link it in the the show notes here. It sounds delicious. It's good. It's a good one. All right. Now, uh, at the beginning of the show, you mentioned, you know, goal setting and and being a goal setter. Uh, So we're at the new year. Like, do you have um, a process or do you set goals for the year or are you just like, hey, I'm just going to work on this for the next month? How do do you do that um, being as productive and goal oriented as you are? I think, well, I always talk to my husband about it because that keeps me accountable. So I think talking to someone, telling something, someone about your goals is what keeps you sticking to them because you don't want to be that person who says something and never sticks with it. Um, so I always talk to my husband about those goals. Um, and then I come up with a plan. Like I want to when total vanity. I want to build a bigger butt for 2018. So I'm going to, hit the gym for accessory work three times a week, doing butt workouts and finding new ways and trying new things. Um, so that's one of my goals and other goals that I have that I won't totally touch on, but I have these other goals. And so I was talking to my husband about how we're going to set or how we're going to meet those goals of going out monthly and doing certain things to help accomplish those goals long term. Um, and I, so I think the biggest thing is setting daily goals to help you accomplish those long-term goals. And that's what is best for me. I write write out a weekly schedule every single day. I have what I need to get done. So not only am I reaching business goals, but I'm reaching my workout goals and my goals to have dinner on the table every single night my husband comes home because he works all day long. And it's all those little things. I write all those down so I make sure I can accomplish them. And those are 
helping me accomplish my long-term goals as well, if that all makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And uh, it sounds very, um, you're connecting all your all your todays to tomorrow, I think is the is the quote. You know, it's, um, you, you have your one thing kind of in mind and you're making sure each day is, is leading towards that, no matter what the goal is or in what area of your life. Yeah. And it's holding yourself accountable. It's so easy to say something and not do it. And so writing down and seeing it and it's looking at me every single day is what helps me keep myself accountable when nobody knows what my other goals are, you know, seeing it written down. That's huge for me and my, my own stepping forward into the future. And now talking about your husband, was he paleo when you met him or is he paleo now? Should I? No, he was not paleo at all. And he, I never talked about it with him. Like I wasn't going to say, Hey, you should go paleo. He actually came to me and asked me what paleo was and if I'd explain it to him and how he could change his own diet. And he kind of changed on his own. So he eats 100% paleo when he's in the house here, because that's really the only things we have. <laughs> um, and then when he's out in the real world, he doesn't have really issues with gluten much, but he's been trying to kind of stay away from it. But because when you, whenever you have a leaky gut issues, gluten is not your friend, but if he's at work and there's pizza, he'll have pizza or he'll have, you know, a burrito whatever he needs to have. But at home, he's paleo just like me because he's eating whatever is put on his plate at the dinner table. That's awesome. And the reason I ask, because I know I run into this problem uh, with athletes and, and people I talk to all the time of them having a lot of motivation or goals set towards nutrition and fitness, and but then their spouse or you know whoever is not as involved. Um, so I was just wondering if you had to get him involved, but it sounds like he was pretty self-motivated in the process. Yeah. And I get questions about that a lot too on the blog. And that makes me so sad when, when you have a spouse that's not supportive of your goals, especially when you're trying to create a healthier lifestyle for yourself and your family, and you don't have a person who's on board with you. Like that just doesn't make sense to me. Or your say your husband or wife refuses to eat the food you make them. That is so fucked up. Like, right. <laughs> are you kidding me? I worked so hard to create this food for you to create a better life for ourselves long term. And you're refusing to take on that lifestyle or that meal. Like, that makes no sense to me. But that's, I think, why my recipes have been helpful for families because they don't feel like paleo recipes when you have a taco casserole or a pizza casserole or this amazing steak. It doesn't feel like paleo. So it's an easier kind of stepping stone into paleo. But that is so offensive. If you have a spouse, no, I, I agree. won't get on board with you. Like if, when you're trying to become a healthier person and for your family and your child and whoever else, like, come on spouse, get your shit together. <laughs> <Right>. So terrible. <laughs> I love that answer too, because a lot of the, like we should, we should go back and just kind of quote you on some of those things because uh, you know, that there's these, these would be like talking points for it when your spouse won't uh, get on board with your, your health choices, because uh, a lot of what you said is it's true. It's just, it's, it's offensive. And if you're trying to make a uh, like better health for your life, like why are you pushing the brakes on this? But I do think, I, I can't imagine that what, what you've never eaten and he's never not eaten anything I put in front of him. He eats it all. Even if he's like, mm, I'm not a fan of this, he'll eat it all. Like, that and I damn think, straight, man. <laughs> so when my wife and I we transitioned to paleo um, uh, a while back, I mean, I'm trying to think of how long it's been, and, and we've kind of gone paleo ish to strict paleo, like in and out of those waves, um, and we still are pretty paleo for the most part. Um, but yeah, we we did transition from kind of what you're saying is like these recipes that are just uh, like what you put out, you know, like awesome tasting, good transitional without having to be like no, there's your steak, you know, and there is your asparagus, you know, it's like, yeah. you, you know, it's actually like these nice uh, transitions. I think that's really helpful for anyone who is out there looking to make some sort of uh, transition is, yeah, go to your website yeah. and pick some awesome transitional recipes and, until you can get the family on board, I guess. And people see food as comfort because it is, especially, you know, we turn to food for emotional support sometimes. And so we see food as this comforting thing. And then if you tell someone who's been comforted by processed foods and complete shit and McDonald's and fast food and whatever else, if you tell them that they only can have this chicken and vegetable, that's so upsetting. And so I try to make my 
a lot of my recipes comforting because I want that out of food. Like I love having a comforting meal that you're like, ah, this is so good. I want to eat this all the time. And that's what I try to come up with that uh, this big burly dude say, who's been eating fast food his entire life can get behind a pizza casserole, even though it has spaghetti squash and things that he wouldn't normally eat on a regular basis in it. So that's really been the long-term goal is getting everyone on board, whether you have kids or you have a picky husband or wife or whoever else, getting them on board with healthier choices. Yeah. And it normally takes the other, like I was, I mean, I've always been into fitness and my nutrition was more bodybuilding nutrition back in the day, like uh, chicken and brown rice for every meal, you know? And yeah, uh, yeah. It, it was my wife who kind of like, you know, started to actually cook the the stuff. We started talking about paleo. And now, like, I always joke, like, I wouldn't be, I would be near as healthy as I am today if it wasn't for my wife, kind of. Yeah, it's just like she she cooks these amazing paleo meals, and I think they're delicious, and I eat them. And uh, if I was left to my own devices to get dinner, I don't know what that would look like if it was every night of my life, you know? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's awesome to have someone who's supportive. Totally. And people should see that. If your spouse is trying to make you eat healthier, it's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's not an upsetting thing. They're not trying to get you to smoke cigarettes and go do cocaine every weekend. Like get behind eating better. That's amazing. That's such a great supportive person to have. All right, Julie, I want to get to the quick fire questions of the show. Are you ready? Yes. What's the hardest workout you've ever done? Okay, it is. And I will always remember this workout. It was an 18 minute AMRAP or it was 18 minutes on the minute every minute. And you had to do 10 wall balls and 10 burpees within that minute. And then you do it again in the second minute and again. And so in the workout, you could drop down if you needed to, like numbers, like go to eight and eight or seven and seven. And I started with 10 and then I quickly went to eight every minute. So eight uh, wall balls and eight burpees. And I had to coach after I did that workout and I had to sit down for a while. I, that was the worst I've ever felt in a workout and it is mentally draining. Like, it is crazy. I'll never forget that workout. Try it. Try no, it I, out. Yeah, I think I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a try. It does sound, it sounds very challenging to fit 20 repetitions in 60 seconds uh, of those two movement. Yeah, of those two movements specifically, because burpees take time. Wall yeah. balls, you're, you have to wait for the ball to come back down. So there's always time in that, you know. Uh, yeah, that, that and some like people would one. say it wasn't so bad, but they would go down to seven reps. You can say above eight to 10, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, that's uh, I'm gonna. I probably will give it a try. It sounds like a a good challenge. It was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Toughness. For me, it was CrossFit because that really built my mental toughness of knowing that I could do anything I put my mind to. If I wanted to make it to regionals, if I wanted to do this, make it in this lift. If I put my mind to it and put the time in. I could do anything. And I think that really changed over into my business and my personal life. And so CrossFit was seriously one of the best for my mental toughness. I, I just absolutely love that answer uh, because I I can, uh, you know, I feel the same way and I can re- relate to it a lot because I, I found fitness at a very early age and, you know, I, I setting goals and achieving them, just fitness in general I, I think it set me up for the rest of my life. You have no real way of knowing, but like just, okay, we want to accomplish something. Okay, what do we want to do? Learn what you have to learn and then and go execute it. And it just gives you so much mental toughness and preparation for achieving things. I, I think that's awesome. Absolutely. It's crazy. Like how much it's crossed over into just my day, day-to-day life. CrossFit is, it's awesome. I wish everybody would try it and just give it a try and really do it for a year and see what it can do for you. It's crazy. Yeah. And a year, not a, not a week or a month. You know, I think, yeah, I think no. a year is a real fair, mm-hmm. uh, fair judgment. Exactly. All right. If you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? A barbell for sure. Awesome. I mean, you can do so much with a barbell. My favorite move is snatch and I love power cleans and then you can do any sort of lift with it. And then you can even do butt movements like hip thrust. There's so much you can do with a barbell. It's by far my favorite equipment for sure. And what's your favorite exercise right now with your uh, butt goal of 2018? <laughs> with my butt stuff. <laughs> um, my, mine are probably hip thrusts. So, you know, you have it kind of right at your hip crease and um, back is on kind of on a 
uh, bench and mm-hmm. you're just kind of pushing the hips towards, if people don't know what a, a hip thrust is, they can Google it, but pressing the hips towards the ceiling. It's just, it works your backside so well. And you're really concentrating on your backside instead of using your quads and using all kinds of different movements. I love the hip thrust. I've been doing three times a week right now and just getting my form dialed in and I'm excited to kind of go heavier and see what I can push my body to do. But I love that for butt workouts. Your butt is so sore. That's awesome. All right. You ready for the question of the show? Yes. All right. What is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? This is 100% open-ended. That's such a hard question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it all kind of ties back to these goals and these resolutions that we all set. I think in most people are trying to become the best version of themselves. And so to become a better human, you got to put in the work every single day and you got to think towards your long-term goal, but that's those little individual goals all along the way, whether that is just to get a 20 minute walk in or make it into the gym or make your meals, set up your meal plan for the week, whatever it is, setting up these goals and making sure you accomplish them every single day is what's going to make you a better human being and become your best self. Like that is what has made me become the person I am today. And I can't wait to become a better person by setting new goals. So I, that's, I think it's that goal setting and actually sticking to your goals, not just saying bullshit into the air, like actually put, putting in the work to become a better person every single day. I think that's, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, really good answer. And especially with tacking on that, that sticking to it, you know, uh, is because that it, and it's the hardest thing to do. Um, you know, it, it gets easier as you become a more disciplined human being, but that, that sticking power is, is the toughest. Uh, yeah. And there's always bumps, you know, like whether you have a baby or you have an illness, whatever it is, we have all kinds of bumps along the way that set us back in our, I'm just thinking fitness goals, but whatever that is and those bumps along the way are what help shape you to know that you can push past those things and really create new goals and, continue along that path of becoming a better person long term, even with bumps in the road. We all have bumps, but that doesn't mean that you have to give up completely. I love it. All right, Julie, what's the best place for people to learn more about you and what you're doing? Well, you can come over to my blog, which is paleomg.com, P-A-L-E-O-M-G. So think pale. Oh my God. And you can find me on social media, same thing everywhere. So whether you want to follow me on Twitter or uh, Facebook or Instagram, it's PaleoMG. Um, I have a YouTube channel that I just post uh, cooking videos on, but you can find those on my blog. So just come visit me mostly on Instagram and my blog and leave a comment there. And oh, and I have a podcast too, which is PaleoMG Uncensored. Awesome. And I will link to all of that in the show notes. Julie, it's been a blast having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. Yes. Thanks so much for having me on. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs>